Thank you so much, Pinky. That was really outstanding. Um, there's a few questions in the queue that I, I'd like to uh, start off. Um, hold on. Um, first one is, um, what nutrition interventions can you recommend for patients with Parkinson's? Is there anything specific for Parkinson's that, that we movement specialists can recommend them? In other words, is there a special Parkinson's diet maybe? So, you know, again, like at least what's good is what's good for the heart is also good for the brain. Sure. So normal healthy diet, including enough fruits, vegetables, enough uh, water, limiting processed food, limiting uh, very highly purified food, all of that can provide increased fiber and um, you know, if one hydrates enough, it can prevent some lightheadedness that can come along with Parkinson's. And so uh, that's what uh, we kind of, uh, the hydration again in the summer months, at least in Washington, it's only a few months of the year. So we have to encourage a lot of hydration. I'm sure uh, Dr. Evidente sees a lot more, um, you know, you, ha you have the longer, warmer months and the temperatures are much higher. So I'm not sure for hydration of a diet if you recommend anything differently, Jerry. Well, uh, given I'm from Arizona, uh, I mean, we have summer six months of the year, right? <laughs> and the rest of the year, even if it's cooler, the, the air is really very dry. So even without my patients knowing or pers uh, knowingly perspiring and, and losing, you know, fluids, they, they do, they do, you know, lose fluids without them realizing it's easier for, I guess, for a patient to get dehydrated in Arizona than, than let's say in, in Seattle or, or Washington state where you are. In fact, we have, we have snowbirds uh, that, that very frequently spend the summer where you are, right? Where it's colder and then they spend the winter here. And, and, uh, and guess what? This is, this is where they get dehydrated. So the amount of fluids that they drink in, in your neck of the woods, it would be probably sufficient because they're not uh, they're not losing as much fluids. Whereas when they're here because of the heat and the drier air, uh, they just need more hydration. But do you have any magic number, number of glasses of fluids or uh, ounces or whatnot? So we try to uh, make it say like uh, try to translate it into cups of water. So about sure. six cups of water at the least. Um, and then avoid drinking, try to get most of that fluid during waking hours. Yeah. You're not drinking right before bedtime because that'll definitely disrupt sleep. And then you need to get up and go to the bathroom. So one easy way, a lot of people take meds about three to four times a day. So uh -huh. try to tell them that every time you have your pills, have it with a full cup of water rather than a sip of water. Now, some people just find it very hard to get six cups down. In that case, we say have, you know, try uh, fluid rich uh, fruits, such as, you know, watermelon or um, cantaloupe or, you know, some citrus fruits, which are sort of uh, rich in water. Uh, that seems to work well. So some people are able to have about four cups of water and then a couple of servings of, of, of fruit. Yeah. And and do you do you count the amount of uh, alcohol they drink or coffee in that in that total number of ounces or cups of fluids they take? <laughs> so uh, we say that if it's um, you know try to limit. The, so sometimes they have caffeine, but then caffeine also makes you go. So exactly. you have tea or coffee, but then you don't necessarily hold on to the fluid because then you have to use the bathroom more. So you can have tea, coffee, try not to make that the major part of those six cups of water. And um, certainly avoid caffeine closer to the evening, maybe just have your one cup of coffee in the morning or uh, tea. Yeah, and, and then not uncommonly, I've heard patients that have misread what they see or read in the internet or what they heard probably in a talk about protein and they think protein is bad for Parkinson's patients. What's your opinion on that? So, you know, like protein is important for everyone and protein is a major, major building block of our body. And, um, you know, all of us need about one gram of uh, protein per kg of body weight. And that's no different from Parkinson's. We all need protein. All one needs to do is be a little cautious of spacing it out. 
Sure. So, um, you know, by all means, you can still have your eggs for breakfast or, uh, but just try to space out the carbidopa. Preferably maybe have your carbidopa on waking up and then give at least half an hour or so and then have eggs or uh, eggs and toast and whatever you uh, need to do. And same thing for lunch, just try to separate. If your lunch is not, um, is not very rich in protein, then yes, you can have them at the same time. They have done some studies in some parts of the world where, uh, especially in Europe, where they found that if you take a lot of your animal protein and put it for dinner, then sometimes it's a little easier than patients because when people are on the go, right, uh, breakfast, lunch, or uh, going rushing for doctor's appointments, it can be a little hard to do all that spacing. So um, try to have more of your protein towards evening where it may be easier to plan the timing. And um, also um, it's a little easier. Sometimes you could have the have dinner maybe at five and have your, la have your lavadopa at approximately 6.30 or 7.00. That's what we tend to recommend. How about you, Jerry? Yeah, yeah, I do the same thing. So I, I, I kind of make them do, you know, 30 minutes, you know, a, a gap between, you know, taking the pills first. We're talking about carbidopa levodopa. It's an issue, you know, with the dopamine agonist or the other Parkinson's medication. It's levodopa uh, that, that's sensitive to animal protein. Uh, and then obviously uh, they live in a real world. So sometimes they do forget, right? So many of our patients with Parkinson's or LDV, they get forget. And if they do so, I, I, I kind of instruct them to uh, to wait about an hour after a protein containing you know uh, meal, and then they can take their carbidopa levodopa. And then if th that still uh, does not uh, fix the issue, and the issue usually is either the dose fails, in other words, they take their levodopa and it doesn't switch on, doesn't take effect, or there's a dose delay. Uh, instead of switching on within 50 to 20 minutes, maybe it takes about 45 to 60 minutes or either of those two. If, if, if spacing it out uh, uh, by about half an hour before or an hour after does not work, then no doubt I, I do exactly what you do, which is I make them take all the animal protein for dinner. Anyway, they're going to go to bed. Uh, and who cares if they're not switching on? Uh, and, and nowadays we also have alternative routes uh, that you do, did mention uh, uh, that get around that that uh, that uh, delay or or failure. So, for instance, uh, you did mention inhaled levodopa, right? And yep. what was the other one? Was it the sublingual apomorphine? Yes. Yeah, but but in your experience, so is this the inhaled levodopa is it influenced by the by the protein that they take, or is it not influenced by the protein they take? Animal protein. The inhaled levodopa. Yeah. So. Um, the advantage of the inhaled levodopa is that it's getting absorbed through the lungs. So sure. people are absorbing it through the mouth and it's getting into the lungs. And the lungs we know are very rich in blood supply. So it sure. does right away. So one of the advantages is that say if someone's eaten a heavy meal or you know, you ended up taking more protein and you're unexpectedly off and you know sure. you need to get yourself on, then it's easy to take the inhaled levodopa and it'll get absorbed quite quickly. And then but then continue the rest of the levodopa the same because this is a smaller dose. It just lets you turn on, but it doesn't last as long as oral levodopa. So continue the oral levodopa so that you can maintain the on time. And you can use it up to five times a day. Absolutely. And, and then um, what about, you mentioned about, you mentioned nausea. Uh, as a symptom uh, of Parkinson's. Are, are there certain medications in your experience that cause more nausea than others for Parkinson's patients? Yeah, so generally it's your dopamine based and the sort of stronger the dopaminergic replacement, the more the nausea. So typically it's your uh, carbidopa levodopa and the dopamine agonists that tend to cause more nausea. However, it's, you know, people do get desensitized. So a lot of the times when people start carbidopa, levodopa, they'll notice some nausea. And then, um, you know, you can either, so sometimes early on, if one has nausea, it's okay to take it with food because how much you absorb can be somewhat less of a factor early on. So just take it with food until you sort of desensitize to the nausea. And then, uh, you know, you can, once you're desensitized to the nausea, you can go back to taking it um, before food so that you have less nausea. 
also the dopamine agonists can cause somewhat more nausea. Uh, your other milder medications like rosagiline or um, you know, nurians, et cetera, those cause less nausea. The apomorphine, that can cause nausea yeah. because um, you know, you're putting it under the tongue and it's getting absorbed quickly. Or if you're injecting the apomorphine, that can cause nausea. Uh, so that's why those meds somewhat, uh, you, know, you need to sort of titrate the apomorphine sublingual to come up with a dose that doesn't make you nauseated. The inhaled levodopa tends to cause more cough rather than uh, nausea in my experience. Yeah, yeah. And then I, I, I want to uh, reemphasize, you know, what you just mentioned about taking a little bit of food uh, with the carbidopa levodopa just in case they get nauseous. And, and I, I just want to add that, that the non-proteinaceous food will probably be more, more appropriate in that setting. Like, for instance, I, I tell them to take it with a cracker or a piece of bread or maybe some banana, but, but not, not a piece of meat, for instance, <laughs> or, or not egg white or... or yeah. Or, Sometimes uh, we've been surprised, you know, uh, we, uh, there was a patient, I know we kept working with the patient and he, he it seemed like his uh, levodopa absorption was erratic. And then we probed and probed and finally we figured out that he was snacking on peanuts all day long. <laughs> and so the nuts, you know, if one, if one snacks on nuts, nuts are supposed to be healthier because they're high protein. Sure. They give that they can absorb. So that doesn't mean one can't have nuts. One should just kind of space it out and follow the food rule with nuts. So, so is there a difference between uh, protein for, from plants versus protein from animals uh, in terms of its effect on levodopa in your experience? Uh, I think in my experience, generally we find that it's the animal protein that yeah. seems to, uh, to block more. But amongst the plant proteins, it tends to be generally peanuts. Yeah. To block and because people take it erratically, they don't really plan a schedule of when to snack, right? They have some peanuts lying in front of the TV and they're snacking on it. So it becomes harder to control. So nuts and then otherwise animal protein. And then this this thing that you mentioned, the delayed gastric emptying, doesn't that contribute to nausea and to let's say bloating and even reduce absorption of or delayed absorption of medications? Exactly. So, like you mentioned. You know, when people's uh, stomach is full um, and if they try to, uh, because they've eaten only, say, the quarter of the plate in front of them and, you know, family's encouraging or they're trying to encourage them to eat, but their stomach is full. And then next, when they eat, they'll find that it's either regurgitating or yeah. they're having some nausea. And then, um, you know, it's um, very tricky to find anti-nausea meds in Parkinson's. So the main one that one ends up using is uh, Zofran or Ondansetron kind of sure. medications. But it's important to remember that Ondansetron should not be taken with your apomorphine class of medications. Correct. So for those patients, it becomes even trickier what to use for nausea. Uh, sometimes, you know, a little bit of ginger-based products um, may help some people with nausea. However, if, it's, if one is on blood thinners, et cetera, you know, ginger can uh, cause a little bit of uh, blood thinning. So if one is already on blood thinners, one has to be cautious with taking ginger products. But sometimes a little ginger shoe here and there will help with nausea. And then I think some patients are confused about this levodopa, carbidopa levodopa, right? Uh, they're not really sure what the carbidopa is for and the levodopa. Can you briefly explain to us what those two components are in their, in their so-called carbidopa, levodopa, or cinnamet? Okay, so um, the cinnamet, actually, the met uh, came from emesis. Uh, right. So met, emesis, and the cine is together. So the carbidopa, levodopa together is to prevent nausea and improve absorption. So what happens is if one were to just take the levodopa, which is the active product, which breaks into dopamine, uh, one, one would have to take like a massive amount of it because the absorb, because most of it would get broken down in the blood before it even reached the brain. Mm -hmm. So to prevent one having to take like grams and grams of levodopa, if one combines it with the carbidopa, then what happens is that the carbidopa carries the levodopa to the brain, sure. and it prevents the levodopa from breaking, and then the 
Carbidopa stays outside, but the levodopa crosses into the brain, breaks into dopamine, and then that's what one needs. So generally, the carbidopa is a smaller number, which is like the 10 or the 25. And then the levodopa is a bigger number. In the US, we have carbidopa. Uh, if some of you ever were in Canada or some other parts of the world, uh, the instead of carbidopa, they have another co component con called benzerazide, which mm -hmm. kind of works by the similar mechanism as carbidopa. Yeah, and in, in Asia and in Canada and Europe, uh, that combination of benzerazide with levodopa is often marketed as madopar. Madopar. It's a very yeah. And I think in Canada, prolopa. I, I think I, th I think you're right. Yeah. So now. Uh, carbidopa. Mm -hmm. Spe speaking of Canada, what about domperidone, which is motilium? Have you ever used domperidone for nausea? Yes. Yeah, so uh, sometimes, because it's so tricky to use, um, uh, for, for some patients, it's very hard to kind of uh, find a medication that works well for them. The, one of the advantages of domperidone or motilium is not only does it help with nausea, but it, it also helps with gastroparesis, so it can help with gastric motility. So it can be a good agent. Uh, there are some uh, restrictions from what I know in the East Coast. Uh, someone told me in New York, apparently there's a lot of restrictions on use of domperidone. And uh, so physicians really have stopped prescribing it. I don't think we've seen so much restrictions in Washington. And the restriction is because there are, you know, some little things about maybe QT prolongation, et cetera. You know, uh, the heart rhythm, it could prolong one little component. Uh, generally, it's not much of an issue, but uh, you might find some people using it more, some people get, uh, getting it less. It's not available in the US. The trials were never done, so it never got approved. But one can get it through Canada. And uh, you know, one needs to go back and forth and set up an account. You don't need to travel to Canada, but you, and it is legal to get it because it was never approved in the US. So you are allowed to get it from Canada because it's technically not available in the US. Yeah, and then I, I think there's also some pharmacies that are able to compound it actually. Uh, like here in Arizona, there's certain uh, ethicary, you know, uh, shops or, or pharmacies that are able to compound the domperidone. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I don't, I'm not sure whether that's true for every state, though. Mm -hmm. What about uh, extra carbidopa? Do you ever use extra carbidopa for patients who get nauseous with their carbidopa levodopa? Yes. So, you know, the um, most of the carbidopa levodopa is available as either 10, 100 or 25, 100. Uh, it, it doesn't really come as any higher. So in other words, you can't prescribe 50, 100 or 75, 100. But for some patients, a 10 or the 25 is not enough for their nausea. And so it's helpful if they were to get more carbidopa. Now that is marketed, it's called carbidopa, or sometimes people used to call it lodosin. Correct, yeah. Now, um, it, at least here in Washington, it's been somewhat tricky getting hold of it because a lot of it's not on several insurances. So though it's very cheap, the medication itself, because it's not on formulary, they almost treat it like a specialty drug and tier four. So it has been tricky for some patients to get hold of it. But if they do, it can be a very um, effective treatment for nausea. So what they could do is they could take carbidopa, levodopa 25, 100, and then take additional carbidopa 25, and that can help with the nausea. Sure. Sometimes if, uh, you know, we try to get that, if for some people the insurance is too expensive, we'll try to switch them sometimes to the slow release. Um, that sometimes because it absorbs, you know, a little slower, people will feel better. I have had some patients, you know, I've had patients on say carbidopa, levodopa, 25, 100, and uh -huh. they ended up on say two and a half tablets. And then they say, oh, you know, we're having so many pills and we're having to break. So why don't you switch me to something higher? And then I've switched them to 25, 250, but then they've had nausea because now they're having only 25 of, of the carbidopa instead of 75, which they were getting from two and a half tablets of 25, 100. So then sure. we revert back to that. 
So it is a good idea to keep an eye on that carbidopa and try to maximize it. So certainly if one's on 20, 100 carbidopa, levodopa, and one's having nausea, it's easy enough to switch to 25, 100. Right. And then you, you, you mentioned uh, at some point uh, sustained release levodopa. So for instance, uh, Cinemet CR in comparison to regular Cinemet, or it's a right parry, which is a combination of IR and CR, it, it just in one capsule. Uh, in your experience, is there any less nausea with, with these formulations with sustained release levodopa? So yes, I would say in my experience, yes. So if someone's having nausea, like a uh -huh. wave of nausea that comes on, say 25, uh, 20 or half, or right after taking the carbidopa, levodopa, IR, in those patients, if, uh, if we switch to the CR formulation, which is the generic carbidopa, levodopa, CR, or right hardy, which is a combination of IR and CR, uh, I do find that the nausea can be improved. I have had some patients who really had, you know, they came to me and um, someone had prescribed carbidopa, appropriate dose, but they had had mm -hmm. bad nausea. And they told me, I never again want to take the drug. But, you know, it is an effective drug. We know that. So I have prescribed uh, in a couple of patients, Ritari, and they have been able to tolerate without nausea. So that's been quite effective for them. In yeah, I agree. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have the same experience uh, because the fact that if you use right berry and, and the smallest uh, capsule strength is 95 milligrams and uh, milligram per milligram, at, at least from my experience, I, I, my conversion is like one is to three. So one milligram of, uh, I mean, uh, three milligrams of, of levodopa in your carbidopa levodopa is like one milligram of the right berry. And in which case, if you give a 95 milligram uh, capsule, it's like giving one third of that regular carbidopa 25 100 in which case patients get less nauseous uh, with it it still has the carbidopa with it but but right. it's a smaller uh, amount of levodopa that they receive in effect okay there's one more question here uh, that i want to address uh, are, are there probiotics that suppress alpha synuclein oh that's a difficult one are you aware of any probiotics that suppress alpha synuclein uh, not that we have any proof of that it suppresses that, but it overall may help with just improving the immediate bacterial concentration. Uh, there are um, some clinical trials that are looking to see whether it could slow progression. And we did one of the trials. It's completed for now. So that's a work in progress. It's um, not, not proven. But certainly in the meantime, we can have probiotics to just improve gut health. Whether it'll actually slow progression remains to be seen. Yeah, but, but I think there's been also studies that, that, that tied up this in inflammation in the gut to misfolding of the alpha synuclein and, and therefore uh, forming of these clumps that you just mentioned uh, that eventually, uh, you know, cause uh, the symptoms, the so-called so early non-motor or, or pre-motor symptoms, uh, mostly GI symptoms in Parkinson's. Uh, so, so I think there's been also some evidence that maybe if you reduce that inflammation by treating the irritable bowel or the, or the Crohn's disease or the ulcerative colitis uh, or whatnot and reduce the inflammation. And if the inflammation is from, uh, from an altered, uh, uh, microbiome, uh, meaning that combination of bacteria and, and, and normal bacteria, healthy bacteria and, and fungi and, 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 and uh, viruses in, in your gut, then you reduce the inflammation around the gut. And maybe in theory, uh, this will lead uh, less, uh, less clumping of the alpha synuclein in the walls. You buy that theory though? I think I do. Um, so you know, knowing what we know about, you know, how it's possibly spreading up the vagus. And we know that constipation is, uh, can start sometimes even 10, uh, you know, 10 years or even longer before the first motor symptoms. Uh, I, uh, you know, I'm very excited to look at the results that come out and I wouldn't be surprised if, it, if they are, if they do show encouraging results. Yeah, and in fact, there's one question uh, in the Q, which, which question, is there any evidence of Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis being connected to Parkinson's? And the answer is yes. Uh, there is actually an increase of uh, incidence of, uh, of Parkinson's in patients with 
with uh, inflammatory bowel disease, and therefore it may be one of the risk factors. And again, we, Dr. Agarwal just elegantly explained that earlier on about, about the uh, formation of clumps of alpha synuclein uh, uh, in the gut because of the inflammatory reaction from this uh, bowel diseases. Okay, what about supplements? Uh, what should not be taken by a PD patient? Ah, this is this is asking it the opposite way. Huh? Instead of asking what what supplements are good for Parkinson's, what supplements are not good for Parkinson's? Yeah. Oh, one um, one that jumps to mind is you know if iron um, if iron and uh, the levodopa hit the stomach at the same time, then um, sometimes uh, there'd be decreased absorption of levodopa. So if one is taking multivitamins that have iron, then you can take it. It's just a good idea to separate it uh, from the levodopa. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, I agree. Uh, in terms of what one should take and not what, uh, here at least in Washington, we have such little sunlight and just like two, two months probably of sunshine uh, that unless one's a snowbird traveling to Arizona, we tell everyone to take vitamin D. Yeah, and then uh, there's also some studies about B12. And in fact, there was a Mayo Clinic study that showed that uh, the frequency of B12 deficiency is actually much higher than we thought in the Parkinson's population. And they also found out that those that are B12 deficient in Parkinson's have more frequent falls and more uh, neuropathy. Uh, and therefore their balance uh, is worse. And also that their cognitive uh, uh, faculties or uh, uh, functions are more impaired than those that are not B12 deficient, which is why I, I keep an eye uh, every now and then, uh, especially in patients with falls and imbalance and numbness and tingles, uh, uh, I keep an eye on that B12 and that folic acid and also keep an eye on their uh, vitamin D as you mentioned, since vitamin D uh, apparently, uh, is is very frequent even before Parkinson's uh, is diagnosed. And if not, if not mistake, correct me if I'm wrong. Thinking, it's one of the uh, vitamins uh, that is deficient uh, in studies uh, that tend to uh, predispose uh, somebody to Parkinson's. Definitely, and yeah. uh, that's why I would say that you know, osteoporosis or osteopenia can be common in Parkinson's, and. Um, you know, sometimes people limit, in my opinion, again, I think there are varying uh, opinions out there about dairy intake. Uh, I mean, I think sometimes it can be very hard, if, especially for vegetarian patients who get enough uh, calcium in their diet if they're not having dairy. So uh, I think, uh, in my opinion, you know, people should have uh, enough calcium through um, dairy or you know, broccoli or however they're getting their calcium. But I know there are some patients who say that they've been told not to have dairy, uh, but I try not to restrict that. Do you have an opinion about the dairy or? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, some patients in previous webinars have questioned about uh, whether they've read that dairy actually may predispose to uh, Parkinson's in the sense that it, it actually fosters an inflammatory reaction in the gut. Mm -hmm. And that uh, there seems to be a higher frequency uh, of uh, even, you know, formation of, of clumps of alpha synuclein in the uh, intestinal walls in patients with high dairy intake. And, and the question is, would does that lead to, you know, higher frequency of Parkinson's? That's one issue. That's it, predisposed to Parkinson's. I don't think the jury's out on, on that yet. But at least in basic science studies, it seems like dairy predisposes uh, to... Uh, more inflammation in the gut and therefore more clumping of this so-called alpha synuclein, which by itself is good, but when it comes, as you, as you elegantly said and, and, and mentioned, uh, it's what becomes pathologic in Parkinson's. But, and then the other, the flip side to that is, uh, you know, dairy is protein, right? It's animal protein, and therefore it can affect the uh, absorption of levodopa if taken together. But otherwise, I don't want patients to be calcium deficient. I mean, we know dairy has lots of calcium, lots of vitamin D is very good. I just instruct them exactly as you just mentioned, just you know, space it out, don't take it together, uh, get the good sunshine and, and, and so on and so forth. Now, what about B6, uh, Pinky? Uh, are you concerned about the effect of B6 in the uh, absorption of levodopa? So, um, the you know, B6, there have been some studies that have shown um, 
especially like patients getting duopa, et cetera, that there might be some uh, deficiency in B6 uh, in these patients. So it's a good idea to, uh, to keep an eye on the B6. I don't think it's standard of care yet to necessarily check people's B6, but in some patients, there can be deficiency in B6. Uh, so if one does notice some neuropathy, especially in patients who are on high uh, doses of levodopa or on duopa, but then sometimes it can uh, make sense to check these B6 levels. Yeah, yeah, that makes perfect sense because the L-dopa or levodopa, whether you get it from natural sources or synthetic sources, uh, will need to be converted to dopamine. And B6 is a cofactor uh, in that in that conversion, so uh, if you and I, I guess the higher doses of levodopa and the more continuously levodopa, like in duopa, uh, that that you utilize or need, uh, the more that you you consume this B six and this B six deficiency uh, can lead to neuropathy. But the flip side is, if you overdo B six uh, supplementation, you can also get neuropathy. So damn if you do, damn if you don't uh, with B6. It's just one of those vitamins you cannot have too much of, nor too little of. Uh, but um, but I, I, I don't think we routinely, though, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, this in my practice, I don't routinely prescribe B6 for any of my patients that I prescribe, you know, levodopa. Right. And actually, it's more of the trying to prevent. Sometimes, you know, we think take more supplements, it's better. Sure. But one shouldn't necessarily take too much of the B vitamins because of the B6 and, you know, the neuropathy that the extra levels can do. So sure. if one is on high levodopa and is certainly, and is noticing tingling numbness and it may be worth checking B6 levels and replacing if needed. But again, it's not routine. Uh, I think more typically we're just checking B12 and folate. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Now we will move to more questions and answers, and Dr. Evidente is going to lead this portion. Dr. Evidente, please proceed. Okay, so um, I'm going to continue on with some of the questions which were uh, submitted earlier on, and and thinking you're still there, right? Yes, I'm there. Okay, okay here's here's one for you and me. Uh, my wife was who was diagnosed with Parkinson's in 2005 has frequent urging. Uh, cramping, alternating loose stools, and constipation. Boy, that sounds like irritable bowel to me. Uh, are there non-pharmaceutical pharmaceutical options available to help with these issues? After eating lunch and dinner, she has to stand near the toilet due to the above, and the stress from dealing with bowel movements can throw her into an off. Okay, any thoughts on this, uh, Pinky? So... Um... It seems that, um, you know, your wife is having, uh, it could be irritable bowel, but sometimes what happens is that um, uh, people um, have hard stools. And so if they're a little constipated and the stool is sitting there in the gut, it can become hard. And then as that hard stool moves to the gut, it can get crampy. And then uh, what happens is sometimes when people get that, packed up, then they'll take something like Miralax or a laxative. And so when they take the Miralax and the stool that forms that day or the next day is a little soft. And so now you have a combination of hard stool, soft stool, hard stool, soft stool, and that can look like, now when the hard stool is sitting, it can almost form like a ball valve. And then the loose stool kind of will trickle past and it'll look like diarrhea but the diarrhea is actually secondary to the constipation. So um, it, I mean, if it continues, you might need to see a GI doctor, but I would at least focus on doing whatever you need to do for the constipation. And uh, the typical regimen that I use and I'll ask Dr. Evidente to pitch into is you sometimes need a combination of things. You may need a stool softener, so you may need docusate sodium, you know, you may need 100 milligrams three times a day or higher. Then you could use Senna at night, a little bit of Benny fiber for fiber, and then Miralax, which makes the stool uh, less hard. Mm -hmm. So a combination of these might be helpful. So it's vital to try to aim for that one movement a day or at least two. 
the longer one goes between bowel movements, the more the, the constipation and the urge and uh, the cramping. Uh, it also helps to be on when one tries to go to the restroom because if one's off, it becomes hard to push with the abdominal muscles. So try to be on, uh, try to have a regular bowel regimen and um, try to use uh, whatever regimen you have, use it on an everyday basis because sometimes people will have a bowel movement and they think, okay, I don't need anything for the next couple of days. And that doesn't work because then that just starts the constipation cycle all over again. Yeah, you, you took all the words out of my mouth, Pinky. Uh, very well said. The, the only thing I want to add is uh, sometimes patients flip-flop from loose stools to constipation depending on what they take. So for instance, if the stools are loose, they take something to, to, uh, to stop the loose stools, the diarrhea, in which case, uh, you know, that leads to constipation. And then the flip side, which is when they're constipated, they take a stool softener and now, and now they have loose stools or diarrhea. Whenever I whenever I uh, I encounter patients like this and I, I, I cannot seem to find that that nice balance, I always always ask help from my GI colleagues. So, a question that we haven't answered from the Q and A Q is: Are there GI doctors in your neck of the woods or that that specialize in Parkinson's patients? Is there such a thing? So um, you know, GI is a subspecialty itself. And uh, to have a subspecialist who just specializes in GI would be rare. However, you know, we did a lot of the clinical trials for Duopa. And, uh, you know, that, as you know, is the stomach pump which delivers the, lev the levodopa. So in that process, the GI doctor we worked with ended up seeing a lot of Parkinson's. And, uh, you know, he got interested and uh, he just developed more of an understanding between the Parkinson's and the Parkinson's plus syndromes. So we preferentially end up sending to him because he's just developed more of an interest in PD. But I don't think that's typical to have, uh, there's no formal GI doctors with who are PD subspecialized. But you know, uh, constipation and some of these issues we discussed are very, very common with all GI doctors see. So I think if you just went to any GI specialist and they were aware of your Parkinson's diagnosis, uh, you could get a lot of help. A lot of times you need to see to make sure there's nothing else going on. There's, there's no colon cancer, there's no ulcer, there's no gastritis, there's no reflux. And any GI doctor would be able to diagnose those. You don't need a subspecialist in Parkinson's uh, for a GI doctor to be able to help you. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Okay, next question. I suffer from constipation since I developed Parkinson's. Will this get worse as my Parkinson's worsen? So in other words, will the degree of constipation get worse as the Parkinson's progresses? So you might just need to work harder to keep that gut going. It doesn't necessarily have to get worse. A lot depends on how proactive you are. And the proactive can be a combination of the food, like we discussed, you know, more of the fiber and the fluid and the vegetables, less processed food. Also enough fluid. Uh, also the exercise. So yeah. like we discussed, you know, pushing or the pushing the stool out or getting the gut going. The stronger your axial muscles are, the, sto the stronger your core muscles are, the less likely one is to get constipated. And then avoiding some of the, sometimes what happens is that with Parkinson's or just with age, there's a little bit of increased urinary frequency. And then automatically people cut down their fluid intake. Oh, I'm going for a drive. I have to go to the doctors. I'll drink less water. And that'll back them up. So just that be cautious about the fluid intake and keep drinking little sips of water during the day. All of that, uh, the constipation, one can get a handle on it and it doesn't necessarily have to be worse, but it's one of those things that need a constant eye. Yeah, yeah. I just want to add that constipation is a very frequent non-motor symptom of Parkinson's even before the diagnosis is made. So. So for instance, if you de novo, you develop constipation, you were not constipated when you were younger, you're now in your 60s and you lose your sense of smell. So that comes, and now you start dream acting. So that combination of non-motor symptoms, constipation being a big one, 
aside from dream acting, um, may, may, may be the earliest signs of this so-called pre-motor or non-motor stage of Parkinson's. And then uh, I, I think uh, the constipation can also get worse as they take more medication. So the higher the doses of their levodopa, the more medicines they take, the more uh, dopamine agonists they take, uh, in combination, the, the, the constipation just, just, uh, just gets worse with these patients and, and therefore they really have to keep an eye as, as you just mentioned. Uh, what about burping? Uh, I had a patient that, that, that asked about burping. So I'm gonna, I, I prepared a little slide on this one. Uh, so burping is also referred to as belching. Uh, so burping is your body's way to expel the excess air that, that enters uh, you know, through your mouth and through your nose. And the causes are things that we do every day, right? So if you eat or drink too fast, so the first rule of thumb, don't, don't eat or drink too fast or don't talk while eating. And, and our, our parents were right, right? Our, our mothers were right when they say, you know, eat and don't talk or don't do the, both at the same time. Uh, chewing lots of gum or sucking on candies or carbonated drinks. Uh, and, and many of us, you know, want that soda, uh, you know, uh, with our meals just to make our meals uh, you know, more appetizing. Smoking is a big one. Acid reflux and H. pylori, uh, which is an infection which is uh, associated uh, with uh, gastritis and increased acid production. So these are the causes of burping. And, and then treatment, just avoid, you know, whatever uh, triggers this. So eat, drink slowly, avoid carbonated drinks, beer, avoid chewing gum uh, or hard candy, uh, reduce your smoking, uh, walk after eating, and of course, uh, it, treat your heartburn. Okay, and then another patient asked, uh, submitted a question, are there alternatives to medicines for acid reflux? So first of all, I, I think thinking, correct me if I'm wrong, but acid reflux is, is more common in Parkinson's patients, right? Yes, it does seem to be. And in fact, what's happened is that I've had patients, you know, they've been on say carbidopa, levodopa, and then they didn't have nausea. And uh, they've been on it for three, four years. And then suddenly they come and tell me, oh, I'm having nausea. And it's, and then they automatically blame it on the levodopa because everyone reads levodopa causes nausea. Sure. Sometimes uh, acid reflux will just present as nausea or people don't feel right after eating and they'll feel upset and they'll call it nausea. So one has to be on high alert for uh, acid reflux in Parkinson's, and it does seem to be more common. Yeah, yeah. So uh, some of the things that 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 predispose to acid reflux, like spicy food, acidic food, carbonated drinks, alcohol, caffeine, chocolate, smoking, uh, greasy food, uh, tomato-based food. So the way to treat this, uh, you know, start with the natural things like smaller meals. Avoid those things that we just mentioned. Uh, don't go to bed, uh, wait at least three or four hours after your last meal. So don't take a, mid, a huge midnight snack and go to bed because that's asking for trouble. And then uh, elevate your head while sleeping uh, because acid reflux, especially when you're, when you're uh, supine, it is, is obviously a, a something related to gravity as well. And then this is a, this is a, this is a uh, thing I read also, uh, sleep on your left side. And I think that has to do with the angles uh, of the stomach and the, and the sphincter, esophageal sphincter. And then avoid tight wasted clothes. But I guess nobody wears tight wasted clothes when you go to bed, right? But I, I guess this is more of an issue uh, during the day. Uh, and then natural remedies, apple cider, vinegar, aloe vera, ginger, bananas, uh, turmeric, honey, and marshmallows. Uh, have you heard of levodopa uh, increasing acid reflux though? Because I've been asked that many times by my patients in the past. I don't think I've heard necessarily of levodopa. It's yeah. Like acid right here. The Parkinson's itself, uh, I think maybe more of a cause rather than levodopa. Yeah, because none of this, from my, from my uh, uh, recollection, none of these medicines we prescribe for Parkinson's really increase the acidity, right? Or production of acid uh, in the stomach. No. Yeah, okay, very good. Okay, constipation. Uh, can Parkinson's medications worsen constipation? We already mentioned that, right? This is a question from the audience. So the levodopa, higher doses, uh, uh, the dopamine agonist. The one that does the opposite is actually entacapone, which is in Comten or Stilevo. Uh, it actually causes diarrhea. And in fact, some of my patients uh, on combinations of 
probably local diva double with some attack upon and they, they have this so-called irritable bowel they're constipated and yet they take their medicine they get diarrhea so now they have this so-called irritable bowel which in fact is not ibs it's all it's all just you know the, the disease itself plus some medicines you take uh, just just watch watch for that that effect of attack upon on your bowel movements. And then I also look at the list of medications aside from the levodopa and the dopamine agonists, like anticholinergic drugs, and 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 very commonly, you know, the antidepressants as well uh, can worsen the constipation, which I think Pinky also uh, mentioned. And then uh, Pinky mentioned this, but uh, let me just go through the first few if you already mentioned, but let me go through some of this laxatives that are frequently uh, prescribed by us or by your GI doctor. So let's start with the, with the osmotic laxatives and the, the mechanism of action would be to attract fluids into the, uh, uh, into the intestinal uh, uh, cavity and therefore you know, make your stools uh, have more water content. So that's Miralax, that's the lactulose, magnesium sulfate. And then there's a stimulant laxatives, which actually work on the nerves, the autonomic nerves uh, around your uh, sphincters and around the intestinal wall that are responsible for, for peristalsis or the contraction of, of your intestinal wall. And so these are the dulcolax and the, and the uh, sodium bicarbonate and the senna or the senna cloth, which again, Dr. Uh, Pinky had mentioned. And then uh, Pinky had mentioned also the stool softeners or the emollients. These are the ones that moisten uh, increase the water con content of, of your stool. So that's cold days or And then, uh, and this is something that, that that's uh, missed uh, it, uh, very often. So and it's very practical. It's virgin coconut oil, which is, uh, if you don't mind the taste of uh, coconut, this is actually a very good stool softener. And I use it very commonly also in my patients. So with constipation, it's natural and it's, uh, it's, 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 it's actually very effective. And then uh, as a lubricant, uh, virgin coconut oil can also uh, work as a laxative. And then if you have the stomach for it, you know, mineral oil and castor oil. But I think many of our patients, Pinky, are not <laughs> are disgusted by, by the taste of mineral oil or castor oil. And many of them get that bloated feeling, or if not get nauseous outright and throw up, you know, after they take this, this, this oils. And then the, the bulk forming laxatives, yeah. Sorry, Jerry, do you think the... I've had, you know, a lot of pay, pay, uh, people do report that if they have the dried coconut chips, that helps a lot with their constipation. Is yeah, it, yeah. Is it the fiber yeah. there or is it the oil there that helps with the constipation? Well, I, I think the, 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 it works as an emollient in the sense that it attracts the fluid. That's how the, the emollient laxatives work. They attract the fluid into the stools, but it doesn't work as a lubricant, no. If you want this to work as a lubricant, uh, it has to be the oil. The oil? So, yeah, it has uh, to be the oil. Do you buy it in the health food store? Or oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you can get this straight off the shelves. And very commonly in the shelves, especially when the AC is, is really uh, uh, really cold, these are in big jars that appear white. Right, so right, right. Light. They look mm -hmm. disgusting, but but actually if you, if you microwave them a little bit and take a tablespoon or two, uh, once or twice a day, it really, really works uh, for constipation uh, mm -hmm. uh, for Parkinson's. Uh, winter sometimes because you know it's colder, more cold here, right? So yep. we tell them to say spread it on toast like butter and just have it like that. When it's oh, good point. Like oh, good point. Uh, th thank you. Thank you for mentioning that because <laughs> some of my patients who don't like uh, coconut, you know, or they they're, they're just disgusted from the thought of taking a, a spoonful of oil, right? Especially if it's that solid white, you know, uh, co coagulated uh, uh, virgin coconut oil. So, so some get creative. They put it in their yogurt. They put it in their ice cream. They put it in Jello. Uh, they put it, in, you know, they even mix it in their coffee, morning coffee, and it it just makes it more palatable, I guess. And uh, in soup, it helps. Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> wonderful. And then, the, and then there's the bulk forming laxative. So, so the principle behind this is that. If you make your stools more bulky, it attracts more water, so it makes your stools bigger, and just stimulates the uh, the peristalsis or the contraction of the intestinal wall. So these are your psyllium, the uh, methyl cellulose, and so on and so forth. And this is a saline uh, laxative. So these are the ma magnesium cyte and magnesium magnesium hydroxide. Again, they draw water into the intestines, and then. Very commonly, and this is where the GA doctors are, are more gung-ho. Uh, they prescribe medications that work through this enzyme called guanylate cyclase, which is supposed to increase the bowel movements 
uh, and, and the most common drugs or brand names in the, in the U.S. are Linzess and Trulance. I, I myself, uh, you know, uh, have not prescribed these drugs, but I, I usually see my GI colleagues that I refer my most, you know, nightmarish patients with, uh, with uh, severe constipation to, and this is some of the drugs uh, that they prescribe. And then we talk about Domperidone uh, uh, or Motilion, which is a pro-motility drug. Although it's a D2 antagonist or dopamine antagonist, and, and uh, it's actually a peripheral uh, antagonist, and therefore does not cross the blood brain barrier, and therefore does not worsen Parkinson's. So again, the way they work is that they, they increase the peristalsis uh, uh, or the contraction of the intestinal wall. And then suppositories, if you were to choose between Dulcolax, uh, which works with the, around the nerves in your in your rectum versus glycerin. Glycerin is, is better because sometimes the uh, if you if you abuse this uh, dulcolax suppositories, it makes the the nerves uh, uh, degenerate around your rectum and therefore it becomes less and less effective with time. It's it's very fast though. And then some of my patients uh, get creative and do their own enemas, uh, which uh, some of my GI colleagues you know uh, frown upon. Uh, there's two kinds of uh, enemas, water enemas and fleet enemas. Water, you just use tap water. And then fleet enemas, they use a, a compound called sodium phosphate, which again, attracts water into the intestines. So there's dangers inherent in these enemas. I mean, if you do it as a rescue drug once, once or twice, uh, that's fine, but not do it regularly. So with water enemas, there's been reports of perforation of the rectum or intestines, water toxicity. And then with fleet enemas, there's the, because of the uh, attraction of uh, of the electrolytes into uh, from the uh, from the blood vessels into the uh, uh, intestinal cavity. There's dehydration, electrolyte imbalance, and even renal impairment. And then uh, I think Pink, I'm not going to uh, belabor this because Pinky touched on this, but I just want to add that that study on probiotics and Parkinson's not only showed improvement of their constipation, but there was a study out of Taiwan. 25 patients, and they actually saw that there was improvement of their Parkinson's, of their UPDR score. So that's a, that's a scale we use very commonly as movement specialists to measure just how good or bad your Parkinson's is. So apparently, uh, uh, the probiotics uh, uh, may, in, at least in the study, uh, show some potential in improving uh, your Parkinson's. And I think the mechanism for this is better absorption. Uh, of your of your medications. So if, you're, if your gut is inflamed because of, of the bad uh, 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 intestinal flora, not the healthy ones, given the fact that uh, Dr. Pinky mentioned that the absorption of nutrients and medicines also is a function of this normal flora, then obviously if you improve that, then you improve absorption. And then uh, Pinky, uh, this is something that I, I thought was, that I just had to mention since it's in line with, with your talk, uh, I thought it was, I, I got grossed out when I first read about this, but fecal transplants of all things, huh? Uh, so fecal transplants have been actually used, believe it or not, on uh, cases of severe uh, uh, impairment or, uh, of, or uh, uh, derangement of your intestinal flora. So there was a study that, that, that did the fecal trans transplants from donors with normal uh, flora versus fecal transplants from yourselves as, 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 a, as a control. And they found out that the fecal transplants from donors with normal flora uh, alleviated GI symptoms and also lessened motor and non-motor symptoms. And, and don't ask me how this is introduced, but, but, but use your imagination. There's two ways to introduce fecal flora, either from up there or from down there. Uh, but this is something uh, that, uh, that is being used, uh, believe it or not, uh, in severe cases uh, of uh, of uh, SIBO or abnormal uh, flora, uh, gut flora. Okay, and then there was another uh, uh, patient that asked me very recently, is there a relationship between high blood pressure and Parkinson's disease? And I, I, I found a study uh, a, done out of, uh, out of Singapore, uh, which showed that high blood pressure actually doubles the risk for Parkinson's. although. Off the top of my head, uh, whenever I see patients with uncontrolled high blood pressure, I, I think about ischemic white matter changes. So this is a, uh, an MRI of the brain, and uh, the, the frontal lobes are here, and the occipital lobes are here, and then the parietal lobes are here. And all this white stuff you see here in the white matter are the so-called ischemic white matter uh, changes. And the more of this you accumulate, 
uh, the more trouble you'll, you'll get into, which may work, meaning you may get Parkinsonism or worsening if you have Parkinson's disease, or you may get cognitive issues or, or dementia. So it looks like uh, controlling your, your blood pressure uh, may actually reduce your risk for developing Parkinson's, especially so if you have a family history of it. And then speaking of uh, vascular risk factors, another patient of mine asked about, he read about uh, uh, the effect of, of controlling your cholesterol. Does that help Parkinson's in, in any shape or form? And again, I found this study, this is the most recent one that I found on a cholesterol pill called Novastatin. And uh, this was a double blind placebo controlled study, seven, seven patients with early Parkinson's. So they compared lovastatin at a good dose, 80 milligrams per day versus placebo over 12 months. And then they measured their Parkinson's to so that UPDRS, their so-called motor scores or Parkinson's scores. And what they found was that those that received lovastatin had a slower progression of their Parkinson's. And this was not just a placebo effect because if you do now what's called a fluoridopa PET scan, and, and, and those of you that have, that have heard of the so-called dopamine scans or DAT scans, I think most of us uh, in the audience are, have heard of DAT scans, well, fluoridopa PET scans are very similar. And, and so if you, this is a way to measure the, the, uh, the degree of dopamine deficiency and the uh, uh, degree of, uh, of um, presynaptic, uh, and, and in this case, postsynaptic uh, dopamine uh, neuron uh, degeneration. So what they found was that in, in the lovastatin group, the, the fluor doa PET scans actually deteriorated slowly. So there seems to be uh, some early evidence that con controlling your cholesterol can actually, which is very common, right? Uh, even in our non-Parkinson's patients, uh, can actually be beneficial uh, in uh, controlling your Parkinson's. Okay, Pinky, any thoughts on that or on the last two slides? Um, so, uh, yes, I mean, high blood, just general health, including high blood pressure. High blood pressure, uh, you know, definitely we know that a lot of white matter disease can cause Parkinsonism, which can cause slowness and stiffness, generally not tremor, but more slowness, stiffness, and balance problems. Sure. And uh, definitely optimizing high blood pressure can be helpful. Also, Parkinson's itself can, sometimes it can be tricky if someone has high blood pressure and the Parkinson's meds drop the blood pressure and cause orthostatic hypotension or dizziness. So it is possible to have both high blood pressure and drop in blood pressure. Um, so again, hydration and uh, just keeping a good eye on the blood pressure can help with uh, optimizing management of Parkinson's. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and thank you for mentioning that combination of orthostatic hypotension and, part, and uh, hypertension, which you know, are, can coexist in the same patient, especially in our Parkinson's population. Uh, it's very tricky because you treat one by using drugs to lower blood pressure, right? That's the high blood pressure. And yet, these high blood pressure drugs tend to worsen the drops in blood pressure when you stand up. So with orthostatic hypotension, it's really very tricky to play that balance. And I guess uh, Pinky just mentioned that hydration is the key uh, in, in, in many of these patients. Okay, I think uh, this was a question uh, uh, which we also answered in the previous webinar. Is melatonin good for Parkinson's? Absolutely. Uh, it's actually a, a natural substance produced by a gland uh, in, deep inside your brain called the pi pineal gland. And this is the uh, melatonin is, is a substance that regulates your internal clock. So all of us have an internal clock uh, that, that, that tells you that it's time to wake up or it's time to sleep, the so-called circadian rhythm. And so in Parkinson's, there is evidence that you produce less of this melatonin, which is why it's very common for patients to have uh, abnormal sleep patterns or get insomnia. And not only that, uh, they've also found that melatonin actually reduces brain inflammation uh, in, uh, in Parkinson's. And, and in that case, in the mice, in the mice models, uh, it seems to be uh, improving motor symptoms in the in mice as well. And then uh, many of my patients have asked about, uh, you know, Zumba, doing Zumba classes, or which is, you know, especially during this pandemic, they're not able to do, you know, live things and, 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 and they're not able to do their boxing and go to the, the gyms and all that. But then, and, and some have asked about dancing. Is that something that benefits Parkinson's? And I found a study, uh, the most recent one came out of brain science, and this was 16 Parkinson's patients uh, versus 16 control patients. And, 
and the Parkinson's patients uh, were were uh, made to do weekly dance uh, lessons of one in and one hour and fifteen minutes uh, for about three years of weekly versus sixteen Parkinson's patients doing no dance training. And what they found was that the dance grew. Uh, their motor symptoms improved. We're talking about the tremor, the speech, the balance, the rigidity but also their non-motor symptoms improved as well. So we're talking, uh, talking about cognitive impairment, hallucinations, depression, and anxiety. So, uh, so I guess the, the, the take home message is, you know, bring out your, your dancing shoes if you have Parkinson's, I, especially during this time of the pandemic, uh, this is something very easy to do. You can easily go to YouTube or enroll in a Zumba class. Any thoughts, Pinky, on that? Yeah, so, um, you know, it's, um... Uh, I look at that same study and it's been very exciting how pretty much any um, exercise uh, modality that has been studied in Parkinson's has found to be helpful. And, you know, some things like dancing, which can be more fun also can help the depression, the anxiety, the social isolation, and it's just fun. So when people have fun, uh, you know, you are feeling more connected. And it's not just the motor, but the non-motor. Other exercise modalities also, which have looked not just at the motor, but then also a lot of the non-motor things uh, that we discussed today and like the drooling and the constipation and all of that. When people have done things like Tai Chi or just walking or swimming or biking, all of those have shown improvement in both motor as well as non-motor symptoms. I, yeah, I agree. I agree. Let me just see whether there's a few more questions here in the in the uh, queue. Uh, does cannabis help ease Parkinson's disease symptoms? Wow. Okay. Uh, <laughs> well, from I, I think we had a webinar or maybe a sem a live seminar not too long ago. We we talked about CBD and THC. Uh, we talked about you know some uh, some uh, case reports and very tiny studies, uncontrolled mostly, that show that maybe cannabis can help tremors. Uh, can help sleep, can help anxiety, uh, maybe even depression. Uh, there's some studies that show that, that maybe uh, it can help uh, dyskinesias in some Parkinson's patients, but it's not something, it also helps aches and pains, uh, I would think, but I would, I would, I would think that the, uh, the, best, uh, the best would be uh, those with, with very high CBD content, if not pure CBD and, and very little THC. Any thoughts, Pinky, on cannabis? Uh, I agree that if one had to use, uh, it's much safer to use CBD rather than uh, THC, uh, which is uh, more of the psychoactive uh, sort of things can happen from the THC. And if right. is uh, using it for pain, then there are local products, like patients often have knee pain or shoulder pain, etc. And there are lots of local products that have less systemic absorption. Uh, one could try the local before one tries the systemic products. And then um, it does, uh, several patients do report that there's improvement in nighttime sleep quality. As far as specifically motor symptoms, I'm not sure. I don't think we have, we probably have more data in MS, et cetera, where it seems to help with spasticity. I don't think there's that much data on it actually helping motor symptoms in Parkinson's, but it may yeah. help sleep, anxiety, and depression. Yeah, and then and then uh, in in patients that take uh, in the population of patients that have taken uh, uh, formulations of cannabis with high THC, there's always concern about about the psychoactive you know uh, side effects of of the THC, and also there's some studies that show that high THC may lead to actually a shrinking of the brain or atrophy of the brain uh, with with chronic use, and we see that even in young individuals that. Uh, that uh, that consume um, uh, marijuana products with high THC content. Okay. Uh, Do you know if they have any uh, GI side effects at all if one takes higher CBD? Do they have any GI side effects or effects? Uh, you you know actually it's the it's the opposite. Some of, yes yes they do like nausea. Although I've had some patients because they get. They get nauseous and, and the, the abdominal cramping when they're anxious. And when they do a little bit of CBD with THC, a very low THC, they actually calm down. And therefore, that abdominal cramping uh, or nausea you know, disappears. But uh, yes, nausea is actually a side effect of, of, of uh, you know, uh, medical marijuana. Uh, and therefore, I probably would not use you know, uh, 
marijuana, medical marijuana to, to treat nausea uh, associated with Parkinson's patients. Okay. okay. And then I think we have time for one more slide. Let me see. Okay. Uh, this is a good one for you uh, to listen to, uh, Pinky. Since turmeric, uh, uh, many of my patients have asked me about this. This is something that is uh, very high, highly consumed by the East Indian uh, population. Uh, I, I usually I use turmeric in my patients. I recommend turmeric in my Parkinson's patients with aches and pains, their arthritic conditions, and achy joints. They're stiff in the mornings, and blah blah blah. And uh, it actually contains uh, so-called aromatic turmeric, which reduces inflammation. Uh, so it's not just you know the joints and inflammation, the joints and, and, and extremities that we're talking about. We're not talking about inflammation in the brain. So is there evidence of inflammation in Parkinson's brain? And the answer is yes. So, so uh, the so-called inflammatory cells in your brain, uh, the microglia trigger a degeneration because they're trying to attack uh, you know, uh, foreign substances, including, including, or, uh, including the alpha synuclein, trigger a degeneration of uh, dopamine neurons in the substantia nigra. And therefore, uh, there seems to be evidence, at least in lab models, that uh, if you give turmeric, uh, it protects the dopamine cells uh, from degeneration. Any thoughts on turmeric from your end? Uh, so, you know, again, I'm a strong proponent of turmeric, and I consume it myself, uh, have eating Indian food. And I've just seen a um, lot of it being uh, consumed in a healthy way. There's, uh, sometimes it can be hard for people, you know, like with the coconut oil, how do we use it? How do we incorporate it into our own cuisine? And uh, sometimes what's helpful is, I just tell them that if you're making any kind of soups or stew, just uh, sprinkle a little on, on that because the people are not used to the taste and they're just trying to have the dry turmeric, it's unappetizing. Yeah. But if you were to, if you're sauteing any food, you know, any vegetables, just put a little bit of turmeric in the oil and then put the vegetables before it burns because it can burn very quickly. Oh, interesting. So, uh, just uh, oil, uh, put it in the oil right before you're throwing in your vegetables inside it. If you're having any soups, then put a sprinkle in and then nowadays you can get quite a lot of products which are, uh, you know, tea bags that have turmeric that you can just dip. So those can be some interesting, useful ways to get it. And if all else fails, then you can have turmeric capsules, but you can yeah. get it at half the price or one quarter of the price if you just buy plain turmeric versus buying it in the capsules, capsule form. Yeah, got it. Okay, I think we're 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 out of time. Wow, this is this was really a, a wonderful uh, you know session with you, Pinky. Thank you so much. Uh, I learned a lot from you and just from this interaction and this. Thank you, Larry.